So this is our workshop uh, about RxJava. And before we get started, I just want to run through the quick things. For anybody who's follow, following along, um, do you have Gradle installed? Do you have a build of Java 8 installed? And do you have a text editor ready? OK, we're good. We are good. OK, so what we're going to go through over the course of this workshop is uh, we're going to go over three things. First, I'm going to try and convince you why something like RxJava is necessary. Um, because it's a bit buzzwordy and some people might have not have any idea what I'm talking about until I get there. We're going to cover the basic case of uh, basically the hello world of, of RxJava. Then we're going to go through some little more complicated use cases using what are called operators to manipulate these things called uh, observables. And then we're going to look at a little bit, a little bit about how we can inter we can engage the, the real world with RxJava, the, the bridge between the reactive world and uh, everything else. So before we tuck in to a little bit of uh, theoretical stuff, let's quickly run through a brief setup process. Um, so what we want to do is we want to set up a Java, Java application with Gradle. So I have here a Visual Studio Code window open with um, basically nothing. So I've got a folder called RxJava. Now, in my terminal, let me make a new window. In my terminal, I'm going to want to go to that that folder um, rxjava uh, code slash rxjava. Can everybody see that? Okay. Make it a little bit bigger. And why not make it full screen? Okay. So code slash rxjava, and then I'm going to run a command uh, Gradle in it dash dash type java application simple as that so I'll, I'll put this i'll put this code back up on the screen but if we uh take a look we'll see that our application is now full of some juicy juicy stuff uh for for building it namely we've got uh this app.java file which has given us a little bit of a hello world application. Now if I go ahead and run this application, I can run it with Gradle Run. And it builds some stuff, and then we'll see this hello world text. Um, for, the, for the remainder of this workshop, I'm going to be running Gradle Run dash Q, which just gets rid of all this extra cruft that Gradle outputs. Um, I don't know what that did right there. Oh, Gradle run dash Q. Um, so that outputs hello world. So to reiterate, to set up, we want to set up a Java project with Gradle in it dash dash type Java application and uh, make sure it runs with Gradle run dash Q. Now that we've got our application set up, let's talk a little bit more about RxJava. So I'm going to ask the question, why, why Rx? Uh, because before we understand what um, Rx or reactive extensions are, we have to understand the problem that they're trying to solve. And it really boils down to the problem that, uh, well, the fact that using asynchron asynchronicity in our applications is really important. Um, and I'm expanding the definition of asynchronicity a little bit looser than maybe what you're used to. Basically, anything where you your code uh, executes uh, after you've run Something that would traditionally be blocking uh, keeps running and, you, and your code keeps running at the same time. So you've got multiple pieces of, of, of program flow happening simultaneously. Um, and yeah, so that, that, that's, that's, the, that's the definition of asynchronous that I'm expanding it to. And you've got things like network requests or multi-threaded computation. And something that people often overlook is the idea that uh, events from a UI are an example of asynchronicity in an application. So for example, if I am a, if I've got a website and there are clicking on buttons, you could have a street, you could have events um, and respond to events as a result of clicking on buttons. Um, and that is, that is asynchronous code because you're not blocking on waiting for uh, mouse events to, to happen. You're doing other stuff at the same time. And this is all really important, especially in the context of UIs because you want to keep your UI snappy and responsive all while, while processing these other things. But it's become more popular recently in other areas such as uh, server processing of HTTP requests, for example. Um, uh, you, can, you can get a, 
a whole lot more throughput if you if you leverage asynchronicity. Uh, so it's useful in, in all areas, and that's that's the thing that RxJab wants to help us with. And the reason they want to help us with it is because um, it's not without its problems. Um, asynchronous code is hard to write because there are so many moving parts. You don't have to like you don't have this uh, linear flow of code starts here and then you go down. Um, they're just they're just lots of moving parts flying all over the place, and because of that, um, it's unpredictable. It's hard to reason about the code that you end up writing, even if it works in some use case. Uh, you can't. Uh, it makes it hard to fathom what's going to happen in different examples and different use cases. And as a result of that unpredictability, it makes it error prone. Um, and it's it's easy to just just rattle off the top of your head uh, some some examples. So for example. Um, what if you've got a user that clicks on a button that issues a request to go load something, um, and do, during that time you set a flag and that sets a spinner in motion, so you can display that um, there's something's being loaded. And at the same time, while that spinner is going, the user then goes and leaves, moves to a different page, the spinner doesn't exist anymore, and then your request completes and it tries to um, make the spinner that doesn't exist now do something. And there are, there are heaps of use cases like that where um, while it may work in the in your small test environment, there are just so many different uh, edge cases that are hard to account for, and that's that's what asynchronicity uh, introduces, and that is the problem that RxJava tries to solve. Now, just a little bit of a, a history lesson about um, what RxJava is. Um, so, RxJava is actually part of a family of libraries uh, called Reactive Extensions, or ReactiveX, or Rx. Um, and I'm on this website, uh, reactivex.io, and I'll be referring to this website quite a few times, and I would recommend you, you, come, you come back to it as well. Um, so so RxJava is actually a family of reactive extensions. Um, and so by reactive extensions, it means these are extensions to the reactive streams that the language offers. Uh, interestingly, Java doesn't have any <laughs> reactive streams to extend, so RxJava creates and then extends the concept of reactive streams, and I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by reactive streams in a moment. But this is interesting to point out because um, it, it brought a lot of popularity. RxJava is, is quite popular in the Java community, especially in, in, in the Android community, and because of its popularity, the, the Java 9 APIs will actually have a concept of reactive streams. So RxJava was so influential that it's changing the course of the language, which I think is a, a, I think it's really cool that, that Java is actually responding to community interest like that. Uh, so, so as a result of that, um, RxJava 2 has, it has been released, and it is standards compliant with this new Java 9 API, even though Java 9 hasn't been properly released yet. Um, this is important to note because a lot of the documentation that you find online might be about RxJava 1, uh, which has a few API differences, not that many, uh, but it's just important to note. So for this workshop, I'm going to be talking about RxJava 2. Uh, it's, it's good to get that out of the way. Furthermore, yes, Tom? So does this mean that RxJava 2 will work with Java 9 out of the box when Java 9 releases? Yeah, and it also works with Java 8, 7, and 6 out of the box. So it, um, it retrofits the APIs that uh, Java 9 uh, exposes. And for a, for a couple of reasons, that's not as hard as that might sound, and I will explain why. Uh, so, as I said, RxJava is a family of, of languages, a, a family of libraries, in a family of libraries called Reactive Extensions, and we can see some of the different languages that it's available for here um, on the ReactiveX website. So you've got JavaScript, you've got C Sharp, uh, you've got uh, Swift. So you can, you can pretty much target any platform that you're looking at. What's interesting is that it's, it's got its own version for Groovy, Kotlin, um, Scala, and these are all languages that are fully Java com uh, compatible. So RxJava, the Directive Extensions team have gone out of their way to write versions of the library that are idiomatic for languages. So they're, they're really working hard on, on making uh, reactive, reactive extensions work for your particular language. Okay, so history lesson out of the way. Long, long and short uh, is that uh, we're using RxJava 2. There are plenty of other reactive libraries, so if you're a fan of other languages, I would strongly recommend checking them out. Okay, so RxJava gives us a new primitive to work with. So it's not a it's not a library. It's a drop-in library that you use throughout your entire application. It's not something that you use for a particular business uh, piece of business logic, a particular use case. Um, you use it throughout your entire application. It gives you this primitive known as an observable and 
In summary, an observable is just a stream of events. So this concept of asynchronicity, this thing embodies it. And I think the, uh, the Reactive X website demonstrates this very nicely. I've got this pretty little diagram where time flows from, from left to right and these events uh, get triggered. And then something, to, something that is to note, so you've got four events in this observable and then this line that indicates it's finished. So observables have a lifetime. They can be potentially infinite, um, but in this lifetime they can emit zero, one, or as many items as, as they seem fit. So you can imagine an observable could represent a, as I was talking about, a stream of clicks uh, on buttons or a network request. Um, uh, it could be a observable of one item that emits the response of an HTTP request and then completes. Uh, so there are there are heaps of use cases for observables, and so off the bat we now have a model for asynchronous computation, which is really valuable. Uh, for for one main reason is that you now have a value to represent these things. So in the past, uh, to model things like event streams, you'd have to pass a callback into a function, and then that callback would be executed. Um, but now a function that represents events, for example, can return something, and that that value can be passed around. And manipulated, uh, which is really good for testing. It's really good for composability. It's really good for readability. Um, and hopefully, I'll be able to demonstrate why that is. So, we've got this thing, an observable that's a stream of events. So, how do we create it? How do we how do we create one? How do we use one? How do we do anything with it? Well, uh, here are two lines of code that you can use to uh, utilize an observable. Um, but before we dive into that, there's something weird going on with this line. Can you tell me what's going on here? Bearing in mind this is Java code. Yes. Sounds like a lambda function. It is. It is a lambda function, which is a new feature in Java 8. And I just want to take a little bit of a sideline um, to, to, to talk about lambda functions in Java because um, this, might be, this might be new to you. So basically, a lambda function is... Uh, something that you pass into a function it's a, a, as an argument to another function and it allows you to that, that function to then call it at some point. So the way, the way it works in Java is you have a what's called a functional interface. So if, a Java, if an interface in Java only exposes um, one, one method, so for example runnable is in the standard library and it has a, one method called run, you can then uh, give it a, a assign a lambda to that type, and it'll automatically do the conversion. So, this this lambda has no arg has no arguments, and it then adheres to uh, adheres to this this specification here. Um, so it only works for interfaces with with one me with one method, but that means uh, automatically old code bases work with Java lambdas as well, which is which is really quite useful. Um, it's effectively equivalent to making an anonymous class, and, but instead it's far more concise and far more expressive. And don't quote me on this, but I think it's slightly more performant as well. Now the other thing I want to draw attention to is what's going on with this particular statement here. Why does this not seem like it might be Java? Tom? Because there's no type. There is no type. Now, as we all know, Java loves to have type annotations on everything. Um, so what's actually happened here is Java has inferred the type from this string here. So just as actually a generic function uh, that, that, has a, that has a type argument, and that type argument has been inferred from the string that we've given to it, and that string has then propagated to this function, and it has inferred the type of line is string, which I think... Uh, makes your code a lot easier to read. So purely from not even using really any RxJava uh, oh. idioms, we've managed to leverage Java type inference, which just makes it your code far more concise and far more expressive, uh, in my opinion. Now, no, it came from it came from here. So just as gener as a generic uh, function, uh, which which and it has a one type argument. And it has inferred that type from this string, and then that's propagated through to the subscribe. But type type inference can go from the other direction. So if you have a return type um, of a function in Java, and then you return something, it can it might be able to in infer the type of the thing you're returning 
from the overall return statement. Okay, let's actually let's actually uh, get some RxJava going. Um, so the first thing we need to do is install RxJava. So I'm just going to search uh, RxJava online super quick, and then I'm going to go to the arrive at the GitHub page, and down here I'm going to see a little bit about getting started, um, and then going to say the first step is to include RxJava 2 into your project, for example, as a Gradle compile dependency. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad. So I'm going to copy that, and in settings. Uh, no, build.gradle, we've got a bunch of information, and in here we've got our dependencies. Now, for some reason, Gradle likes to include uh, Guava, but we don't want that. We want RxJava. So I'm going to obliterate those, those two lines of code. I'm going to put this in, and it's given us a 2.x.y, which doesn't work. And I happen to know that the version that we're targeting is 2.0.7. Now I'm quickly going to make sure that this works by typing gradle run q, nothing should be different, um, but I should get some useful output. I shouldn't have done q in this case because it's actually downloading rxjava. Okay, so that's working. Um, I'm going to make this not full screen anymore, so I can have it here. Okay, so that's worked. Now if I, now I actually want to leverage this, so I'm going to run this code that I was talking about. So first thing I want to do, and never forget this, is I want to import uh, io.reactivex.start. Now this is a the package, uh, it comes with all the, these primitives that I was talking about, and in particular, it comes with that observable thing that I was talking about. So I want to do observable dot just and then I'm going to put in hello world and then I'm going to subscribe to it, pass in a lambda function and then call system.out.println. Cool. And now if I run that, I see hello world. Okay, so what we've done is we've created a, a stream of one thing, the string hello world, and we have subscribed to it, and then our subscription is say, whenever this thing emits something, go and print that out. And so it's printed out that one thing, and we've, we've used RxJava. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this up because I can see you're all frantically copying. Okay, so just to reiterate on what we've done is uh, print print hello world with observables. Just a quick thing you could try doing right now is see if you could figure out how to print multiple lines. Uh, uh, don't put it in your subscribe call. That would probably be the, the easiest way to do it, or put new lines embedded into your strings. Okay, I'm going to soldier on. So that is the that was the first part of, of this. We've covered how to we've covered why you might want RX and basically the the first tidbits of how you're actually going to utilize it. And we've used we've learned a little bit about Java lambdas as well.